You needn't whisper. I'm awake now. Oh, Professor Jones. I was just putting something on the shelf on this bottle. It was an accident, sir. Oh, all of science is. Some of our greatest discoveries came from broken bottles. Well, it's Saturday, and I guess we were in a rush to get out. We'll stay and clean it up, sir. No, no, no such thing. Who knows? This may be the afternoon to fall in love. Ultimately, get married. Experience illusion, disillusion. Fall in love again, get married again. Experience more illusion and disillusion. How could I possibly stand in the way of such a delightful future? On your way. So you can grow to as old and cynical as I am. I like cynical older men, Professor. All the rest are liars, my dear. The dream again. It had traveled with Ernest Johns across time, 35 years, and across an ocean, the one between England and the United States. And it still intrigued him. As an intelligent man, certain aspects of the dream of the red trolley car seemed quite clear. Obviously, it was based on an actual childhood experience. It dealt with death, a small boy defying death over and over again also obvious. But what puzzled Ernest Johns was why he always awoke from this particular dream feeling rather elated. To dream about almost getting killed and to awaken elated, Ernest Johns found that an intriguing riddle. Registrar's office. This is Professor Ernest Johns at the lab. There's been a small accident. A bottle of dimethyl sulfate was broken. It's odorless, but the vapors are lethal. Two of my students and I cleaned it up without being aware. They must be found at once and checked out at a hospital. Um, Jessica Belner and William Gwen. I? Oh. I'll check in at the hospital. Detectives are Carol and Flint. Dr. Butlin. Doctor, how do you do? And the two students. Uh, Jessica Belding. I'm William Gwen. I actually knocked it over. Uh, doctor, they're okay? We don't know yet. We're keeping them here under observation. How come none of you knew what you were doing? It's... I guess our minds were someplace else. I understand the professor didn't say a word to you before you left. Didn't uh, ask you about what you dropped. He'd been taking a nap in his office. I guess his mind was someplace else, too. He's been kind of way out now the past couple weeks. Hmm? It's all right, Doctor. Take them to their assigned rooms. He... he's...
probably home. Maybe he checked with his family doctor. Oh, sure, sure. sure. Uh, thank you very much. We spoke with his wife. He called a university. He knows, doesn't he? That's why we called you. Doctor, I wonder if you have any of the stuff around here. Hmm. Uh, can I smell it? It's odorless also. I wouldn't advise her. How fast does it work? He's the doctor. There's no odor or initial irritation to warn a person. And liquid or vapor, either way, it's very lethal. Well, how fast does it work? The respiratory tract mainly. Nose, throat, larynx, trachea. After six to eight hours, depending on length of exposure, pulmonary edema sets in. Then, uh, just a minute, Doctor. I wonder if you could be a little more specific in layman's terms. I mean, so that will help us to know what we're looking for. For instance, what symptoms will you be looking for in those students? Well, first, the eyes. Nothing. Tearing, photophobia, mm -hmm. light sensitivity. Oh. Uh -huh. Followed by impairment of vision. Next stage, shortness of breath, shrill, harsh breathing when it hits this area. Then severe coughing accompanied by extreme pain. That would usually come around six hours after exposure. After that... Well, what about uh, treatment, antidote? As far as antidotes, none is known. Huh? None? Beyond a certain point of exposure, there's no hope. Up to a certain point, we can treat each symptom locally and get some success. Now, wait a minute, Doc. I don't mean to imply anything about your medical experience, but are you sure there's no antidote? Quite all right. When the registrar phoned us, I started checking the German medical journals. Why the German? Well, they developed it into a military poison gas known as Die Stoff. But they don't give an antidote. You, you haven't heard from him yet, have you? Well, Mrs. Johns, uh See, it's now our responsibility to find your husband. Is there anything we should know? Well, is there any reason why he uh, might decide not to... Uh... We were separated three weeks ago. Three weeks and two days, to be exact. I took the initiative. Well, I... Uh, I know you probably don't want to talk about this. I don't. Could you tell us where he might be staying now? I... I think he's at the Campus Hotel. Campus Hotel. Well, thank you, Mrs. Jones. How much time? Five or six hours, depending on the length of exposure. Thank you. Another professor? Uh, uh, no, not just for the moment, thank you, Billy. Funny, I, I've never noticed that clock before. My pride and joy. Beauty, isn't it? Yes. But don't you think it's strange? I've been coming in here for three years, and this is the first time I've ever noticed this clock. Not strange at all. Yes, it is. Very strange. Very significant. The only significant thing about it is that my wife told me she'd give it to the garbage man if I didn't take it out of the house. So I brought it in here today. That's why I didn't see it before. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> me. <laughs> or is it I? No, I was trying to read some significance into my life, some strange new significance. And what has it come down to? A housewife, house cleaning, a trash collector. Trash, you see? Sure. There's no mystery, no significance even now. Just another clock. I just don't keep looking at the clock. Oh, was I? I'm sorry, Anne. It's really a way of playing on your sympathy, isn't it? Ernest, um, would you 
hear me out just for a few minutes. I just can't it wait another time. Another time. Listen, darling. In the weeks since you asked me to leave, I've had time. Isn't it funny how often we use that word? I've had time to think. I really brought you to it, didn't I? I seem to be a man who simply can't accept what other people call happiness. You love me well, Anne, and always. And yet the very evenness of your love seemed to drive me to challenge it. An odd quirk, isn't it? Yes. Let me say it all, darling. Uh, those other women. Surely I must have known you'd find out sooner or later. I even became flagrant about it. I forced you to send me away tonight. I seem always to live for danger, where other men seek peace, for challenge and threat, where others see calmness. Don't I? I can't blame you for what you did. You were always a woman of quiet pride. But we... Would you reconsider and take me back? No, Ernest. I understand. Dennis, where are you going? I'm well with it. Right. Odd quirk, isn't it? Ernest. Darling, let me say it all. Those other women. Surely I must have known that you'd find out sooner or later. I even became flagrant about it. I forced you to send me away, didn't I, darling? I seem to live for danger, where other men seek for peace, for challenge and threat, where other men seek for calmness, don't I? I can't blame you for what you did. You were always a woman of quiet pride, but will, would you reconsider and take me back? Ernest. Darling, if you turn me down, I'll understand. Believe me, I'll understand. Anne, I hate to put you to this. I'll just go. I understand. This business at the land. Have you been to a doctor? Perhaps I'd better go to one now. Anne, I can't say I blame you. Oh, darling, your illness is to seek a threat where there's calm, and my illness is to love a man like you. But then perhaps love itself is an exquisite illness. Oh, I imagine you're not sure. I imagine you want to think it over. No, I, I think we can work things out. Ernest. Well, I'd better go. Well, I'll go with you. No, not necessary. Well, which doctor are you going to? I'll go right over to the hospital. Ernest! have gone. Maybe he knows he's all right. Maybe we're really on a wild goose chase. If he knows he's all right, why did he call the registrar? Why did he say he was going to check in at the hospital? He's an important man in his field, Frank. Maybe he knows he wasn't overexposed. Important or no important, how would he know without being examined? Maybe he is and maybe he's not. We don't know that much about the man. So let's say you got all the angles on this case. Just tell me one thing. We got a simple police assignment here to find him. We do that every day without getting clinical about their personalities. 
How is it going to help us complete a simple police assignment? Tell me that. That's just it. I don't believe it is simple. We're dealing with a very complicated man. Well, who isn't? If we want to find him, we have to know the man inside and out. This way, Mrs. Jones. Mike, give me a little rope, How much? Let me see what I can get from her. This is Lieutenant Parker. Detective Flint, you know. Your husband hasn't shown at the hospital, Mrs. Johns. Why did he come to see you? He asked me to take him back. I agree. I don't understand. We figured he hadn't gone for medical attention because of his uh, marital troubles. Now you tell us... Mrs. Johns, are there any other reasons, like maybe his work or other associations that are depressing him? His work? Yeah. A scientist is used to failure, Mr. Flint. A scientist is a man who fails a thousand times in order to succeed just once. Is that one of your husband's expressions? Mrs. Johns, do you think your husband wants to die? My husband is a man who seems to feel most alive on the verge of disaster. Now, doesn't that sound strange? No. Surely, Lieutenant, you have men in your own department whom you describe with praise as, as men who are great in a pinch. Did you ever wonder how often they create pinches to be great in? Miss Johns, who is the head of your husband's department? Professor Enright. Mrs. Johns, do you have any suggestions of where we might look for your husband? No. Thank you, Mrs. Johns. By the way, what day is today? It's uh, Saturday, Professor. All day. I first heard that joke 50 years ago. Since today is Saturday, all day. It was yesterday we had a talk. About his latest research? And other matters. The department. Tell me, Professor, was his latest piece of research a failure? Failure? On the contrary, young man, a brilliant breakthrough, a remarkable piece of work, quite remarkable. He must have known. But the look on his face when I told him the committee's conclusion. What kind of a look? I almost had the feeling that he'd rather I told him it was no good. <laughs> <laughs> on top of that, we talked about, about me. That's when I really felt he'd take his hat and go. Well, what about you? Oh. Time, time, time. Are you planning to retire? I wouldn't call it retirement, young man. I have lots of work to do, lots. He's next in line. Well, how did he take it when you told him that? Not well. Tell me, young man, why is he behaving so foolishly today? I told you no chicken soup, Max. Listen to me. Eat. I told you I'm on a diet. Stripping is hard work. Chicken soup will give you energy. Chicken soup gives energy to chickens. And I'm not a chicken anymore, Max. Oh, I don't know. 
You're all alike in show business. Beautiful, but no brains. You should be like me. Yeah, then we'd both be waiters. <laughs> Beat it, will you, Max? Oh, it's him. Still having lunch at four in the afternoon, eh, Teresa? Breakfast. You don't look so good. You want some tea? I was hoping I'd find you. What's the matter? I feel terrible. Take a pill. Just like when I first found you. Tough shell. You hate me. And why should I? It's been months since I even phoned. I, I owe you an apology. What for? For breaking through your shell and, and then just disappearing. I mean, it's like urging someone not to be afraid of the water and then it's going off and leaving them to flounder. You must hate me. Now, I'll tell you something, Ernie. For a smart man, you're a stupid man. Just like when I first found you. And it's all my fault. I'll tell you why you're stupid. You teach chemistry. You don't know nothing about chemistry. Hard again, Lisa. Hard. No, people chemistry. In your laboratory, with your test tubes, you understand pretty good. Now, you take a pinch of some chemical and you put it in a test tube with a bunch of other junk and the old junk changes, don't it? Risa, why won't you accept my apology? Like this tea. You see, I add sugar. It's still tea, but it's uh, a little sweeter. <laughs> Ain't that right? What are you trying to say? Well, I'm just like this tea, Ernie. It's still tea, but somebody uh, added a little sugar. <laughs> So you don't owe me an apology. Same old tea, just with a little sugar. No, you're lying to me. I've hurt you and you just refuse to show it. You want a testimonial? You hurt me? It's just not true, Ernie. That... <laughs> Ernie, are you sick? Ernie, I'm a stripper. If you got the flu or something, don't give it to me. Go here now. Go to a hospital. I live by my looks. I gotta stay healthy. Dr. Branson, is he in? No, he's on the phone. But you can't. You have no appointment. He's on the phone. Wait just a moment, Captain. Who are you? Detective Flint, 65th Precinct, sir. Uh, about a year ago, I was on a case. I talked to you. Well, you must be familiar with departmental procedures. You see, I'm on a case, and there's a time factor. Uh, could I see you for a few minutes? I'll uh, call you back, Captain. Flint? Adam Flint, sir. Uh, just one question. Doctor... And normally, when a person attempts to commit suicide or succeeds at committing suicide, we assume, of course, that he's depressed. Now, is it possible or conceivable that someone would attempt to commit suicide for the opposite reasons? What opposite reasons? Well, when, when everything is going well, better than going well, when, when life concedes to give a person everything they ever wanted, now, is it possible that someone would decide to commit suicide at that point? Look, Detective Flint, it's against any decent psychiatrist's ethics to offer opinions on a man he's never, never seen, whose history is a blank, a I, patient he's never met. I understand that, Doctor, I really do, but you see, there's just no time. Man has been exposed to poison. He's a university professor, and he keeps ducking everyone. Now, it doesn't make sense. Uh, we thought it was because he had split up with his wife, but he visited his wife today, and she wants to take him back, so it can't be that. And in his work, he's just cracked through with some major research. He's up for the head of his department. And he certainly has everything he wants. Now, is it possible that... I, uh, shouldn't do this, Flint. I may be a million miles off since I don't know the man. But it's more than possible. It's very frequent. Frequent? Uh, great in a pinch. You've heard the expression. 
I could name you a number of famous people who did themselves in right after a brilliant success. But why? How does it... How does a person get that way? I can't give you a pat answer. Well, doctor, for my purposes, can you uh, give me some idea? Can you give me a handle? We're all primitive in many ways. At least uh, some of our emotions operate on very primitive stimuli. Uh, imagine a, a native who makes a pact with the gods in his life. You want me to be unhappy and miserable? He says to his gods, okay, I'll be happy to please you. Being miserable will make me happy, he says to his gods. Now, what if that primitive man suddenly finds all sorts of joy and success coming his way? It'd scare the living daylights out of him, wouldn't it? Terrified of defying his gods. So, what does he do? Drives all of the joy and success out of his life. And then, only then, does he feel happy. Oh, if the joy won't go away, well, he, he might just die of fright. Hmm. But that's primitive man. And we're dealing with a highly civilized man. Uh, we all have our personal gods to whom we pledged ourselves. Starting way, way back with the parents we wanted to please. of procedures. You spent precious time playing Sigmund Freud. Now, are we any closer to stopping this guy from doing what he intends to do? But my standard procedure hasn't helped us any either. Let me tell you another thing, Detective Flint. When you abandon standard procedure in favor of high-flying techniques in each case, what happens to the tens of thousands of people in this precinct that we are responsible for? Standard procedure is the best guarantee that every man, woman, and child in this precinct has that when they need us, we'll be there. Yeah, and speaking of your Professor Johns, how do you expect me to feel sorry for a guy who wants to die not because things are bad for him, but because things are good for him? But don't you understand, Mike? He suffers the same way the depressed guy does. Now look, this guy is tying up a whole police department. He's got our shoes nailed to the floor. Now let's get back to standard procedure. We've got his hotel covered, his home, the university, his favorite restaurant, his favorite bar. Now, besides his wife, does he, does he have any other relatives? His mother. She's senile. Hey, wait a minute. That's it. She's in the rest home. How could he? His mother. Frank, if he hasn't been out there already, he will be. Frank, he will be.
I'd like to see my mother, please, if I may. I'm sorry, but I, I'm new here, so if you'd give me your, her name. Mrs. Ernest Johns, senior. Oh, yes. She's having her tea now. Five o'clock. You know, the English tea. Oh, that's right. You're English too, aren't you? Uh, go right ahead, uh, down the hall. Oh, good. Someone for tea. Oh. You a friend of my husband's? It's I, Mother. Ernest. Oh, of course. In time for tea. I always have an extra cup ready. Just in case. Isn't that nice? There's... Mother, I've got to talk to you about myself. No, no, no. You must, you, you must have your tea first. There. There you are, Ernest. Thank you, Mother. Right. Now, now we can talk. Mm. Have you had a good day at school? <coughs> oh, there now. I warned you, you've been running too hard on the playground. Now you've done it. Oh, Ernest, your father will be angry with you. You know he will. Mother, Will you listen to me for a moment? I do hope he won't get back before your coughing stops. He won't like it once you're bitter, Ernest. And he'll be severe with me, too. Nenis sana incorpora seno. A healthy mind in a healthy body. That's his favorite motto, and it's a very good motto, too. Please, Mother, I've never asked you about this before, but it's very important to me. Well, now, listen, you, 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 you tell me quickly before he gets back. Do you remember when we lived near the amusement park? Did people ever talk to you about this habit I had of running in front of the trolley cars? Did they, Mother? The tram cars, Mother. Did they? The inspector's coming. There's no more to be said. Have some more tea, son? <coughs> oh. Where are you going, lad? Uh, I'm going to do my schoolwork, Mother. Oh, good boy. the inspector and all he's done to us where's the professor he's gone we asked you to detain him well it's not my fault usually they stay longer before i knew it he came out i, I oh, tried to talk go? to him did he walk did he take a cab could you see he just started walking about five minutes ago. Well, usually they stay longer. Maybe we'd better start circling. Five minutes, just five minutes. While we're circling, I'll call you. Yeah. Lieutenant Parker, please. Lieutenant Parker. Mike, Adam. We missed him. I know you did. You know? How could you? We just... Cruise car spotted them at the waterfront in the 128th Street area. Get going.
There he is, Frank. Professor Jones! Professor Johns, we want to talk with you. Oh! 
I'll be all right. Please. Why have you come? The tea's all gone. There's no more tea. Son, what have you been doing? You look disgraceful. Oh, have you done your schoolwork? Yes. Yes, ma. I've done my schoolwork. Mother. I hate the inspector. Yes. Yes. Oh, but, but you mustn't hate him. You mustn't hate him, son. You mustn't hate the inspector. He's your father. What, what must I do, mother, to make him like me? I'll tell you what you must do. I know, I know. You see, the inspector is a door man, and you take after me. There is joy in you, son. I know, I know what you must do. You, you must, you must hide it. You must hide it, because he thinks the joy is sinful, and you must not challenge him with your joy. That's what you must do, son, to please him. You see? You see, wasn't that easy? Joy is sinful. I must not challenge him by being joyous. Well, uh, did he want me? Did he want a child? A marriage was arranged. I had nothing to say about it. I remember when he first came to our cottage to meet me. It was autumn. Summer was dying. The leaves were falling. And I saw his face. I thought, what an appropriate season. Oh, oh, my son, you've caught cold. You must have some honey. Thank you. It's all right, my son. Oh, what a lovely summer that was. Before that autumn. Such a joyous summer. Oh, 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 what a joyous summer. said it would be all right. <laughs> we don't have any children. <laughs> he 
never wanted it. There are eight million stories in the naked city. This has been one of them. film presentation from Columbia Pictures. Herbert B. Leonard, executive producer.